This is the word of the Lord from Luke 4, 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Renee. Well, you may notice some of my clan is missing this morning. Um, Frances has her first head cold, so we have to go to the doctor tomorrow morning. And I suspect she's probably back asleep again because she's been sleeping a lot now that she's got her little cold. But she's still rather happy and joyous, so uh, don't worry too much about her. She'll be back in form in no time, and I... We'll take this opportunity to recover from all the scrapes and all the hair that's been yanked out and all the other joys of parenting. You know, I don't like to overgeneralize um, things or, or people. Um, I still do it. I just don't like doing it. Uh, but I can confidently tell you today that there are, there's really three kinds of people in this world. You ready? I got it for you this morning. There's three kinds of people in this world. There are uh, people who love what we might call the great outdoors, the wilderness. They love to, to camp. They love to hike. They love to hunt. They love to fish. They love it. There are people who loathe the great outdoors and the wilderness. They would rather have a, a hotel with a pool that is far and away from the mosquitoes and the wild animals. They'd rather have the hotel and the pool rather than the, the, the tent and the cabin with the lake. And then there's sort of some folks who are kind of in the middle. They, they love the wilderness, just not all of the things that make it wild. Um, I'm, I'm probably in that middle camp. I, I actually love uh, hiking and doing all of that stuff. I just don't like all of the other things that are hiking along there with me. You know, the bugs, the creatures, the spider webs, all of that stuff. And, and in fact, um, uh, my wife can tell you uh, about the time we went to uh, the big island of Hawaii for our honeymoon, right? Um, and, and the whole time we were there, we were like, we had this active continuum going on where it's like, all right, on a scale of like zero to a hundred percent, what, where are we at in terms of whether we're, we're ever going to go back, whether we're going to go home, or if we're just going to stay here? Could we live in Hawaii? And by the time we finished it, we were actually at like 80%. We were like, yeah, 80% sure I could live here. The, the, the 10% um, that kept us from not wanting to live there, actually it was more for me. I, I pretty much accounted for all 20% of why, because there were things there, the natural aspects of Hawaii, that I didn't find as agreeable. Uh, for instance, the mosquitoes there. Uh, there are lots of mosquitoes uh, on the Big Island, especially where we were staying, and I am um, cursed with being attractive to mosquitoes. I get bitten each year disproportionately to the average person. They love me, and there's nothing that I can do to stop them other than to, to smite them with my mighty hand. Um, so there was, there was that aspect of it, and, and, and Hawaii was beautiful nonetheless. There was, there was that, but, but there was also some of the, the wild creatures, particularly in the water. 
Um, my wife and I got to actually swim out in the bay with, with wild dolphins. They were, there was a pod of them that was in the bay the morning we were out swimming. I, am close, I was closer to a spinner dolphin, a, a wild living spinner dolphin than I am to any of you right now as we speak. There was one as close to me as this chair that I'm looking at right now, and I saw it. Its, blue, its blowhole shot water out, and I got hit with the spray. Um, that was awesome. What was not awesome were the eels that were under us as we were swimming out there or the other unidentifiable creatures that were there that were spiny and looked like they were poised to attack me. And then, then there's the, the landscape too. I, I don't know if any of you know this, but Hawaii um, is pretty volcanic. Um, it exists because a volcano erupted a long time ago and it's the only state in the United States that actually adds land area every year because there's been a volcano erupting since the 1980s and it adds just a little bit of land each year so it's actually expanding. Oh, and speaking of volcanic activity, um, uh, almost 11 months to the day on our honeymoon where my wife and I took a helicopter ride and we looked over the volcanoes we saw inside the craters, we saw the lava, almost 11 months to the day after we did that, that big traumatic volcanic event last year began. So all of this, all of, I have video of it, all of these beautiful shots I have, yeah, those areas are now covered in lava uh, or dried lava. Uh, so you can kind of see maybe where my aversion to the wilderness comes from. And, and so it's with a little bit of anxiety this morning that I tell you that we're gonna talk about wilderness today. The text is about wilderness. When we come to these kinds of wilderness texts, like the one we have this morning, we, we tend to bring along our preconceived notions and our preferences about the wind wilderness too. I have my own, as you all have your own. For some of us, the, the wilderness is vast and beautiful, or it's challenging and unpleasant, or it's remarkable and remarkably uncertain. But for the, the Jewish people in Jesus' day, wilderness would have conjured up very different images. So instead of like camping in a tent, uh, they would have thought about journeying. Instead of thinking about safety and comfort that you might find in a hotel, they would have remembered the years they spent peering out of their own tent flaps in a seemingly uncertain situation in the wilderness. Instead of thinking about all of it with caution, like I do, the idea of wilderness would have brought up images of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. In fact, Moses' own story is fraught with wilderness moments, right? After killing an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew slave, he fled Egypt and was led where? Into the wilderness, which became a place of refuge for him. Then years later, Moses saw a burning bush, and from it came the voice of God. And all of a sudden, the wilderness where he was at became a place of calling, and Moses had a choice to answer. He tried to choose one thing for a long time and then finally chose the other. And from that calling, the wilderness would once again become a place of refuge, except this time for an entire people, right? the Hebrew people who were now refugees from the oppression of Egypt. They had escaped Egypt. You remember the dramatic events, the plagues on Egypt, the escape, the flight, crossing over the, the, the sea which had been parted, coming over to the other side all dry and nice. It was great. Now they were in the wilderness too. And once again, God spoke in that wilderness, but this time through the Ten Commandments. God called his people to be a people of covenant relationship both with him and with each other. And in the midst of all of this, the wilderness then became a place of provision where God's people, God's children, were nourished with manna and quail and with water from rocks. However, this wild and untamed wilderness was more than just a place of refuge and calling and provision. It was also a place of great temptation. At every winding turn and every dark valley, and in the shadow of every rocky peak, the people of God were tempted to forsake the one who had led them out of Egypt and who had sustained them miraculously on this journey. You might remember some of the ways that they faced temptation and more specifically the ways they fell into the temptation and sinned. They, they crafted and worshipped statues. They, 
grumbled about the food and the water. They even bemoaned being in the wilderness to the point that on a few occasions they said, why don't we just go back to Egypt? You know, the place where we were slaves, why don't we leave the wilderness and go back to that situation? And finally, when they were told to take the promised land, they elected not to trust God, and as punishment for not trusting God, they were forced to wander the wilderness for 40 more years. We see these 40 years of temptation and trial, of hope and promise, reflected in these 40 days on Jesus' own wilderness journey. As he steps out into the wild, he too finds refuge and calling and temptation and provision all in the wilderness. So today as we, we talk and we walk along this journey uh, of temptation with Jesus, the word invites us to ask a couple of questions today. Keep these in the back of your mind as we go forward. What does the wilderness, wilderness look like for me or for us as one body? And how is God inviting us to step out into the wild regardless of whether we love the wild or we'd rather stay in the hotel. Now, Luke recounts some very interesting things that happened before Jesus' wilderness journey began. In Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist, who, whom Scripture calls a wild man, a man of the wilderness, spoke of preparing the way for one who was coming. Hills and mountains shall be made low, he said, and crooked paths, those are going to get straightened out. The wilderness, as Luke sets it up for us, is not something to be avoided, but rather is something that Jesus Christ himself enters into. The wilderness is the prepared way by which Jesus comes. Ah, oh, man. The wilderness is what Jesus steps into and the way in which he comes. So all God's people with wilderness aversion say, shoot. Shoot. But while, we, while, while some of us may loathe such wilderness or get anxious about it like I am right now, Luke 3 offers a soothing reminder that the wilderness is not simply a place of barrenness. It's also a place of promise. Because you remember from the wild comes the voice of God in the burning bush, right? And from the wild once again and into ministry comes the word of God, the fully divine and fully human Jesus Christ. Luke 3 also reminds us that Jesus doesn't go into the wilderness alone. Do you ever think about this? The triune God went and ventured into the wilderness journey. Do you remember what happened just before Jesus stepped off into the wild? Jesus was not only baptized, but the Holy Spirit descended on him, as Luke recounts, like a dove. And the voice of God, the voice of the Father, spoke, This is my Son, my beloved, in who I am pleased. Just as the triune God is revealed fully at the baptism, so too is God about to be revealed in the wilderness. Because the one triune God goes into the wilderness. Our text says that Jesus fasted for 40 days, just like Moses fasted for 40 days and nights as he prepared to receive the revelation of God on the stone tablets, the law. That's in Deuteronomy 9. The practice of fasting in the Old Testament was done often in preparation for divine revelation, whether it was part of a, a ritual, a broader a movement of worship where we are choosing to fast before God, or whether it was very informal, very reactionary, such as a, a tragic thing has happened and we're fasting. We're fasting not simply because we're grieving, but because we're wanting God to reveal God's self to us in our moment of grief, in our hour of darkness. So whether it was formal or informal, fasting was the way that people prepared for God to reveal God's self. In the same way, Jesus chose to fast on this journey, but the difference is, here's the cool part, folks, the difference is that instead of simply having God revealed to him, he is revealed to be God. The God who initiates the wilderness journey is revealed to be the God on the wilderness journey. And because of this, for us, wilderness is not a barren or desolate place. Because God is there in the wilderness, 
we find refuge in the wilderness. If you look in your bulletins this morning, there's some fill in the blanks. That's the very first one. We find refuge in the wilderness of God, or in the wilderness because of God. Folks, there's going to be times when we all individually and, and as one body, as a church, are led into very wild places in life. Many of you have already been to those wild places. And, and while we often choose to maybe resist these places, we have to remember that not only can these wild places afford us moments of refuge and formation, they're also the places where God leads us precisely because God is already there. God is not leading you to a place where God is not already present. And as we lean into Lent, remember that these 40 days, they sort of provide us an opportunity for, refer, uh, for refuge and for reformation, a time to remove ourselves from the chaos of the world and to prepare for the divine revelation of our God in our lives. And it often requires that we, we step out into the wild. And again, all God's people said, darn it. Now, the, the wilderness wasn't just a, a furlough for Jesus. This wasn't just R and R time. Because we know from how the rest of this chapter plays out that Jesus is actually preparing for his public ministry. And his preparation didn't simply end with the baptism, but actually with the time he spent in the wilderness. Uh, just five verses after verse 13. In, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, we find Jesus in his hometown declaring, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to bring good news. In other words, who Jesus is as the Son of God, declared, by the Father, declared so by the Father at baptism, is actually reconfirmed in the wilderness. As I grew up in the church, this particular scene, whether it was in Luke's gospel or in Matthew's gospel, was always, was always portrayed as sort of the star witness, the key witness to the claim that Jesus lived a sinful life. How do we know? Well, look at this temptation moment. He was tempted right here, and he did not sin. There is your evidence, exhibit A, for why Jesus lived a sinless life. And, and, and that is, that's true, but that assumes that this text is simply trying to prove that virtue. And if you're like me, let me challenge you today to look at this text a little bit differently. And here's how I want you to look at it. Jesus' temptation was not simply about proving his goodness, but about actually demonstrating his godness. If, if you are the son of God is how the devil sets up two of the three temptations here. This moment of trial where Jesus is, is, is uh, 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 basically being tempted to, to sin, this moment of trial was about who he is, exemplified in what he chooses to do in response to the temptation but Jesus' life did not begin and end with these moments of temptations. In fact, when all was said and done in verse 13, what does it say happened? The devil departed from him until an opportune time. In other words, Jesus would experience more temptation than simply what is recorded here, folks. Now, while we tend to weigh Jesus' response to these temptations based upon what he said, which does kind of sound a little bit weird to us, I'd like us to consider also what Jesus said didn't say in response to the devil's wagers. He never denied that he was the son of God. Instead, he reiterates that he is a humble servant who is devoted to worshiping and serving God alone. If the baptism answered the question of who Jesus is, the son of God, the wilderness answered the question of why Jesus had come in the first place. And why did Jesus come? To be a humble servant suffering servant. And as we heard last week, Jesus was like Moses and that he was about to lead the world from the oppression of sin on an exodus from death to life. Here Luke is once again portraying Jesus with mosaic imagery because like Moses, he's led by the Spirit into the wild, the place of temptation. Jesus' godness is affirmed and his calling is made clear by all of this because it's in the wild that God's calling often comes. Friends, we, we can't be afraid to, to step out into the wild places where God is leading us, both personally and as a church, because like Jesus, because like Jesus, and this is your second fill in the blank, 
We are given a calling in the wilderness. The wilderness is the place where we receive our calling. In this season of Lent, we are not merely anticipating the moments of the cross and the empty grave. We are also preparing ourselves to hear the call of God in our lives. During these 40 days, God may be calling you, or all of us even, to speak freedom to others or to trust the Holy Spirit. The call may not come dramatically. There may not be a, a burning bush or really wild moments of temptation where we're taken up to the highest place in town and told to, you know, give it a shot. But we do have to be open to how the still and small voice of God may be calling us and also where the calling might happen in these days. You know where I was called to ministry? In the basement of a, of a, uh, a fraternity house, the floor is sticky with beer. Uh, I wasn't partaking. That was just the quietest place in the house where I could study when it wasn't the weekend. That's where I received my calling to ministry, the wilderness of a fraternity basement. Keep that in mind as you think about stepping out into the wild places and wondering if God really does call you in those places. Now, having said all of the things that we've just talked, or that we've just said about the wilderness, that it's a place of refuge, that it's a place of calling, that it's the place where the triune God ventures in willingly and where the identity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God is reconfirmed again and again by the devil himself, mind you, the fact remains that the wilderness is also a place of temptation. Jesus steps out into the wild in order to be tempted. He is tempted to, to meet his immediate physical felt needs on his own and in his own way. Make this stone a loaf of bread if you're the son of God, the devil tells him. He's, he's tempted to succumb to celebrity and authority. Hey, I'll give you glory and authority among all the powers of the world who have bent their knee to me, all you need to do is just do the same thing, is what the devil tells Jesus. Jesus is tempted to succumb to power. Go on, urges the devil. Reveal God's power to the world by making him save you. Step off the ledge. Do it. These seductions, once again, point us Back to the Exodus moment, because following their dramatic escape from Egypt, the freed people of God began to face temptations. They grew upset because they wanted to provide for themselves and their own ter on their own terms. They told Moses at one point, you know, if you would just let us go into the promised land, we wouldn't have to eat this yucky manna and quail. In fact, we could be doing our own farming if you'd let us do that. They grew dissatisfied with the strangeness of God to the point that they commissioned a statue to worship instead. They began to complain that if God really was powerful and had their best interests in mind, then God would start showing it and start showing it soon. Let's go, God. You're on the clock here. My friends, the, the temptations of the wilderness really don't change all that much, do they? We may look at how Jesus was tempted and think, you know, those are some strange ways to tempt a person, telling him to turn stones into bread, uh, telling him to bend the knee to the devil. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, come on, there's, there's more subtle ways to cause a person to sin to do that, because I mean, who would really do that? Oh, jumping off a building. Yeah, that's the way, that's the way that I'm going to tempt God is to do that. That sounds like a great idea. And yet, these are the very temptations that God's people faced before Jesus, in Jesus' time, and that we face today. These are the questions like, can God be trusted to meet our needs? Can, can God be trusted to not allow us to be forgotten or to be overrun by those who have more power than we do? Can God be trusted to be powerful, especially in the moments where we call upon it, God save us? They are, they are really real and heavy questions, and they often require a response that's beyond simply a yes or no answer. Jesus doesn't give yes or no answers here. Jesus gives far more than that. He understands that there's more to life than just food and how we get it. He understands that God alone is the only one who is owed glory and honor. He understands that in tough situations, 
the proper response is not to test God's power, but to trust it. The Israelites made those mistakes on the wilderness journey. They made them. They did not trust God. They did not believe that God was the only one owed honor and glory and power. They wondered all the time, despite the fact that the manna and the quail were there every morning, what they were going to eat every day, what life was going to be like on a day-to-day basis. Jesus, however, Jesus showed us what the story looks like when those mistakes aren't made, when, when God is fully trusted. Jesus' temptation and his response to it are good news for us today too, my friends, because like Jesus, and this is your next fill in the blank, we experience temptation in the wilderness. There's no getting around the reality of temptation. And if you're not being tempted, might I suggest you need to step out into the wild because you're missing out on the refuge and the calling that you might receive from being there. Friends, Lent is a season for facing the things that tempt us. Often this is done through fasting, through giving up the things that we enjoy in order to draw closer to God. That's why we give things up during Lent, not because there's some special magic to it, but because it reminds us through this self-denial and through prayer and through meditation on Scripture that we have a propensity to fall to temptation instead of trusting God. And in this season especially, We can learn to stand firm against temptation through the power of Jesus Christ because when we trust in him, we are trusting that God will indeed take care of us like a shepherd takes care of his sheep. Amen? In Matthew's gospel account of the temptation, Jesus is attended to by the angels following his temptation. After the devil leaves him, the angels come to him and tend to him. The lie behind the devil's very first question of temptation, that God cannot be trusted to meet your needs, is obliterated by the truth of God's love in action. Jesus is ministered to because God truly can provide for our needs. Unlike the Israelites before him, what Jesus trusted was that he didn't need to leave the wilderness to be cared for because his father was already present and caring in the midst of the wilderness. And the Holy Spirit, too, remained present with him, providing for him in the midst of the hardest temptations, temptations of the flesh, temptations of the spirit, temptations of the mind that must know going forward that the kingdoms of the world were not going to bow to him, at least not in honor. The only ones who would bow to him are those who would mock him, that the kingdoms of the world would not proclaim him king except so in a mocking way as they crucified him. In the midst of all of this, Jesus trusts that there is provision in the wilderness. And in the same way, friends, and this is your final fill in the blank, we receive provision in the wilderness. It's, it's true. I, I often think of the wilderness as sort of a dark and and kind of dreadful place, maybe even a wasteland because of the temptations that are there, that are tough and that are exhausting. But we're all reminded through this text that God does not abandon us, even in the midst of the wilderness, because during this season of Lent, we may discover that when we are faithful to seek after God, God not only provides for us, but also does for in ways that we don't recognize. Think today about a way that you've been praying to God, asking for provision. I'm not, I'm not talking about all those times you prayed um, when you secretly went out and bought your big lottery uh, jackpot tickets. God, let this be the one. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the things that you need, the things that you are burdened by, things that affect you or that affect all of us, but that are burdens for you nevertheless. Lent invites you to not only offer up those needs to God, but also to be vigilant for the ways that they are being met by God and you just haven't realized it yet. Lent affords us an opportunity to begin recognizing. What ways might God already be providing for you in the midst of your wilderness or in the midst of our journey in the wilderness 
as one body. As we close, friends, the, the wilderness, it can't be avoided. I, I, I don't like it either, but it can't be avoided as much as we might try to avoid it. It is without doubt that we will find ourselves in the midst of the, will, of the wild and untamed expanses of life at one time or another, individually or as a church. It's going to happen. It is going to happen. The temptation is to try and avoid letting it happen or to view the places that are in the wilderness as nothing good, as the places where no good can happen, or even to view our journey as something that is not good itself. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, our church has heard and at times has echoed the grumblings of those who wish for us to abandon the wild, even if that means returning to a proverbial Egypt where there is nothing there, nothing but enslavement and death, no future. But my friends, the wilderness can also be a place of growth. The wilderness can be a place where we are restored, where we're challenged, and where we are called. It can even be a time to see the provisions of God in the midst of scarcity. And some of us live in very scarce situations. The wilderness is the place where God already is. Don't you want to be where God already is today? As a people, let's walk into this time of Lenten wilderness with the expectation that God is going to walk with us through it all.